In this episode of Life After, I finally sit down with a queer theologian. Uh, Taj M. Smith joins me to deconstruct queer theology, transitioning, and how his love for sci-fi shapes his outlook for the future. Toward the end, we discuss an episode of Star Trek Next Generation named Darmok that fit into the conversation perfectly. You won't want to miss the special intermission interview, Spooky Edition. New Barna research has been released that indicates every time you think about reviewing the podcast but forget to, Mark Driscoll starts another church. Please do your part by rating reviewing the podcast on iTunes. Five stars. Of course, don't deconstruct alone. Join the Life After Secret community on Facebook. Do you like the work that I've been creating and think that it's important? Please join monthly contributions on Patreon. This is Brady Harden, and you're listening to The Life After. I hope that you enjoy this episode. I have a funny relationship with the word queer. It was used as an insult when I was a kid from bullies, like my brother and other kids at school. It's one of those words that over time, it changed its meaning. And now it's a label that I'm proud of. When I started to deconstruct my beliefs, I finally gave myself permission to be who I am, and I came out. The word queer, though often used as an insult, now is a catch-all umbrella for the LGBT community. What it means is those of us who are different, we're not the sexual majority, but we're the sexual minorities who have come together to make a coalition to fight for each other's equal rights. Just because our experiences are so different, many of us have been cast out of our families, we've had to rely on chosen family instead, etc. There's a camaraderie over being the outsiders. When I came out, I started to bump into queer theology. I didn't quite understand it. It was the same God that I had prayed to and repressed myself, but they were saying that this whole time he was okay with gay people and okay with queers and okay with lesbians and trans people and it didn't add up i felt that we were talking about two different things and it came across as telling me that i wasn't understanding god and i didn't understand god at all this whole time but that they definitely did it was kind of annoying i would ask questions and literally wouldn't get an answer back or the answers i did get back were just very lackluster Recently, somebody started to respond to me and we were able to have a conversation that helped me understand how it's supposed to operate and where can we find those common goals in what we're doing. Toward the end of the conversation, we discuss an episode of Star Trek Next Generation. I know this is really nerdy, but even if you're not into this show, this episode is so intriguing how different cultures can communicate. Taj and I, we tried to represent that even in our conversation of people who come at our queerness in different ways. We still have so much in common. Here's my interview with Taj M. Smith, a queer theologian. He's a big sci-fi nerd. I'm confident you will enjoy this conversation. Take a listen. Let me kind of unpack that for you a little bit. Today on The Life After, I have Taj M. Smith. Welcome to The Life After. Thank you so much, Brady. Uh, thanks for having me. I am so flipping excited about this because I found out about you instantly. Hey, I need you on this goddamn podcast that I do. Uh, can you kind of give a crash course of who you are, what you do? This is so exciting. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, so I'm a spiritual imagination coach for uh, spiritual imagination and leadership coach for radical and progressive faith leaders who are uh, just trying to make the world a better place. Um, trying to make the world a more inclusive place. And um, so that's one side of it. The other side of it is just doing spiritual reclamation work for queer folks who have been hurt by religion, uh, but who are still interested in engaging with spirituality on their own terms and in ways that aren't going to oppress them or make them feel bad about who they are. You also studied science fiction. 
<laughs> and that kind of wedges in in an interesting way because we only were able to kind of make community. Many of the listeners and myself, we were only able to make community built around one set of very specific stories and narratives. Um, and you're kind of figuring out ways to say, uh, if that's kind of the expectation, fine. Also, there's ways to kind of do that in other avenues. Can you speak to that a little bit and help me understand it? Because I'm so intrigued. Yeah, I studied uh, science fiction and queer theology. And so a lot of the work that I do is around figuring out ways to read scriptural scriptural text, sacred texts in ways that uh, point to the future and allow us to engage in questions about the future, open up curiosity, open up imagination uh, so that we don't repeat the mistakes of our pasts. Um, I feel like so much like theological and scriptural reading uh, focuses on like what's already happened or what's present um, and not so much about what's possible. And like, that's, that's my big question. And the question that I want for not just, uh, not just faith leaders, but like people in general to hold on to is like what's possible. Um, And science fiction is an amazing tool that points to the possible. That intersection, when I saw on your profile, queer theology, science fiction I ran at it so hard I I have so many questions about theology or queer theology as somebody who is a fundamentalist I took everything literally you know I didn't repress myself because I hated gay people I did it because I wanted to obey a god that I thought I was in a relationship with or that knew me or what you, you understand and so walking away from that kind of left me not understanding how that works and when I would kind of get the answers to my questions it was always in a way that was kind of telling me that it should have been obvious that god was cool with queer people and I should have just picked up on that And kind of framing it in that way is harmful. What I love about what you're doing is finding ways to communicate that in a different way that doesn't kind of leave some of us left feeling responsible for silence that we didn't earn. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, there are so... I've, I've read so many books and so many uh, listened to so many lectures and like heard from so many scholars, people who were like, of course, God loves queer people. I'm like, but that's not obvious. And that's not obvious for those of us who are like, who have been embedded in religions where like all we know is that God is going to be that queer people are like evil or whatever, um, where it's just so baked into the ways that like scripture and theology is done it's not obvious that that god is cool with queer people to phrase it in a way that makes it seem like it is obvious it's like victim blaming agreed absolutely i think a lot of times when we are theologically minded or we're kind of used to being the one that people look to for spiritual advice or spiritual guidance whatever a lot of times We try to fix the religion and make it look good. We want to kind of twist spin city it, right? Um, The twist, the truth, and oh no, it was never like that. Um, But when we're deconstructing, my focus now are are people first. And if we want to use this word, uh, redeem, I want to redeem the, the people's experience, our experience, um, not God's. I, I guess my job, my thing is to make sure that the first things first is that people are being heard and understood and that their experiences are being heard. So much of re- like religion is a tool to help people live to be in better relationship with each other. Mm. <laughs> Just so many ways Christianity is failing to help people be in better relationship mm. with each other. And it's in fact, uh, doing the opposite it's like there are all of these at least in i mean in the states at least like there are so many like churches that are actively trying to uh separate people in ways that are not not good not helpful not not life-giving not sustaining not sustainable for the planet for uh human relationship so like if that and if that is quote unquote the truth 
like, well, where does that leave us? Right. I know that there is a better way. Mm -hmm. And I know that like, yeah, people have to come first in that relationship. People have to understand how we relate to each other and how, uh, how whatever divine spiritual supernatural presence uh, you, you, you want to take along with you, how that helps make that happen. Cause like, yeah, we can talk to our imaginary friends all day long, but at the end of the day, like if you're going to be rude to that barista or to that like cashier or whoever at the checkout line, you're not doing it right. <laughs> A big part of us understanding that community and how we can operate in it is knowing ourselves mm -hmm. and knowing our own story and who we are. Do you mind sharing what was your background? Did you grow up in a religious household? Uh, no, no, not at all. Actually, my household, my mom didn't raise my brother and I to be religious at all. Um, she, I mean, there were books about religion around. There were books about spirituality around. I think my mom asked a lot of questions about spirituality and was really interested in it. But when it came down to uh, exploring religion, that was something that I found on my own through friends. I grew up in a place where religion is, it's like the thing to do. Uh, if you're a teenager who's not part of a youth group, then it's like, what are you doing? Um, but, but I, yeah, I, I found, uh, or rather I said, I should say evangelicalism found me, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. spooky season among us yes <laughs> uh yeah evangelical evangelicalism found me in middle school um by high school like i was out i was an out queer person and just completely divested from the church just because i just saw how it was hurting so many people around me and i realized i'm like if this is if this is who God is, I don't want anything to do with because like... And it doesn't help that the Bible has that passage about, hey, you can judge um, beliefs by their fruit. And then like we get a really bad fruit and it's like, hey, JC, did you mean you too? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like the person that I have become has not been has been both because of and in spite of religion yes yes made us prioritize the things within it that are kind of presented as an all or nothing package mm -hmm. and because of where we are it made a sense right then in that context but when you zoom out and it's just like anything else with medicine or whatever when you take the answer to one situation and apply it copy and paste and apply it to another that doesn't mean that it's going to be the right solution for that situation that time and place right right it's like it's like being in a tunnel you know that there is a whole world outside of the rest of that tunnel but like you can only see what's directly in front right of you yeah it was right there and uh for i mean for fundamentalist religion it's it's a tunnel that never ends <laughs> and yeah. the, the yeah. light you see at the end of it is whatever light supposed to supposedly the light of god but i mean nope <laughs> it's, not, it's not showing that it's that's not what it's producing you realizing that you're queer and did you start to, did that create fiction, friction with people inside of your spiritual community and family? Um, how did you cope with that? Um, for a good while in high school, I had, a, a, there were a number of people who solidly tried to convert me every day. Um, <sighs> people who they were, they were trying to bring me back. Um, into the fold that's heavy it, for high schoolers god yeah yeah I, I mean my response was always thank you but no <laughs> um because like i mean my mom didn't raise a fool and knowing that uh and for in my experience having been hurt by religion and seeing the ways that the church was hurting people around me. Like, like I wasn't, I wasn't about to go back to that. I wasn't about it. And it became my part of my mission in life, which I mean, this is a heavy mission for a high schooler to take on, 
but was to like bring my friends who were captured by it out of it too. Whatever I did didn't work. But uh, I mean, I, I'm still reconnecting with people from like high school who are who went to conversion therapy then and are out now. Wow. Yeah. It's almost like you all were playing a game of capture the flag. And it was like, who could get the more people? But you're kind of winning now the long game of it. So congratulations, <laughs> uh, Taj. I'm going to mail you over a certificate. <laughs> College changes everything for so many of us um, who were able to kind of get away from where we grew up and kind of see that bigger world. Mine wasn't too far away from where I was. I, I went to a community college in the middle of Missouri. Disgusting. But how did your college experience then help evolve your queerness? I mean, I went to a community college too at first. And, um, okay, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And the um, show Community... Hey, you know, great show. All about a community college. Just throw it out there. <laughs> it's so on point in so many ways. <laughs> and it's real. That was real life. So I can count it as a influence. Thank you. It's like, you mean the documentary series? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Abed, Abed, Abed. Abed. <laughs> um. When I was in community college, that was when I really started. I leaned into uh, activism and like marriage equality activism really, really hard. Really decided that, I mean, I have always been interested in dedicating my life to some greater cause in whatever way I saw fit. And I mean, for coming from where I was, like seemed like uh, marriage equality and like uh, queer rights that was like the biggest issue in my mind and so I did I threw myself into it when I trans I transferred to a four-year university UC, UC Santa Cruz and I transferred there that was probably the first time I had ever been encountered with the whole like like LGBTQ spectrum the whole umbrella um, and I realized that there is so much more than marriage equality and there was so much more that I could be doing. Um, and so I, I was still really, really heavily involved in activism. But I, and it was part of that. I remember it was one of the years where it was something like 13 queer youth, kids under 18, I think for the most part, kids under 16 uh, committed suicide. And uh, we held a candlelit vigil. And I remember the, the campus minister at the time, he stood up and he said, he said his name and he said, I'm gay and I'm your campus minister. And I just kind of like zeroed in on him. And I was like, I'm finding this guy after this thing. And as soon as, as soon as the vigil over, I beelined, I beelined for him. And then uh, found this him surrounded by a little group of queer Christians. And I started asking all these questions and he's like, you know what, come hang out with us, come to our Bible study. And I was reluctant at first. Cause I'm like, I don't know. I have done this whole Bible study thing before and it's only produced pain. Like what's, what's going to be different about this. And he was like, it's going to be different. So I took the chance and I went and I just, I just asked question after question after question about everything having to do with queerness. Cause I mean, I mean at, at the time, like I had no idea that queer Christians even existed. <laughs> um, and to find a group of six of them all at once, I was like, it was mind boggling. I became a regular at this Bible study every week I was there. This group became like my little family um, in college. And I found that the, the more questions I asked about religion, about my identities within that, and about how I uh, am faithful, the closer I got to my own gender identity and being a trans man. <laughs> I, I, I always said that the, the closer I got to God was the closer, the closest, I, the closer I got to God, the closer I got to my gender identity <laughs> and uh, eventually came out as a trans man. And um, then it was like, oh, oh, this whole thing with uh, religion actually feels, feels legit for me. Uh, let's stick with it. <laughs> um, college really, really changed my life in a lot of ways. I think before then I had on, been on a straight track to law school. I was planning on being a civil rights lawyer, doing nothing but advocacy and activism, and then being a senator. <laughs> 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 right? 
Uh, I no longer have that goal. (laughs) Uh, but I do think that my college experience showed me just how important spirituality can be on this, in the steps to finding oneself and to being true to oneself. And so since then, my, it really set me on the path to, to helping other people do that as well, to like find themselves within themselves with the help of the spirit spirituality as they see it um not necessarily this isn't me going with like this isn't me going with like a bible and being like oh you have to do it this way like no no this is all about how they hear the machinations of the world and society working around them and how they want to fit into it and making it work for them getting to know who you are reflecting on that And then how do you live among other people who are in some ways alike with you? And then the people who are also different than you. What I see you doing is important, like you said, and emphasized on your own in a great way that do it in how they see the world. When we're trying to communicate with our families who are still in fundamentalism, a lot of the listeners who come from the same background as me, um, it's difficult because we've grown away from that. And there's not that central language necessarily that's crossing over as much anymore because we're being seen now as an outsider. When you have that insider outsider mentality, you don't have necessarily the ability, the access, the privilege um, to have a two way communication. Because if you're not listening to anyone, why should you be speaking? You know? Hey, that's a great question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Fundamentalists, listen. <laughs> <laughs> The, the way that I came in contact with you is um, listeners of the show. And if you follow me on social media or know me personally, I can at times be critical of queer theology a lot. Um, and and it's because it, it, it had a be under my bonnet and it um, it stuck with me because I had so many questions. And from my experience, when I would ask those questions to people who in that field, necessary, I wouldn't really get an answer back. And then that kind of put a bee in my bonnet even more. And so what I appreciate with you is that you were able to interact with me and, and answer some of those questions. Um, I want to touch on that when we get back from the break. But thank you for doing that. Thank you for kind of like being willing to hear those Um And I've got some that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, But the way that you described some things was really helpful for me as somebody who's questioned everything. And then the work that you're doing of helping people find themselves through storytelling, even if it's outside of the brand that we all grew up with and saw as holy, it's fantastic. And it's so needed. And you're such a breath of fresh air. Thank you. Before we go to the break... I'm not going to save this until the end, Taj. Can you tell people how they can find you and your and what you your coaching services? And then I'm going to have you kick us off to break. Sure. Um, so you can find me on Instagram at, at Taj dot speaking. Uh, same on Twitter, although I don't use Twitter that much. So don't actually follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Instagram. (laughs) Um, uh, And on my website, uh, www.tajmsmith.com. You are listening to the Life After Intermission special interview. Corey, I'm really glad that you're sticking around to help with these. And for a spooky season, I have the quote angel from Netflix Midnight Mass, thanks to Google Translate. Um, if, so if you'd like to avoid spoilers on the show, please fast forward. Um, angel, how are you? So sleepy. I flew in for this interview and boy, are my wings tired. Ha 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 ha. It's strange as a Zoom call. You don't have to go anywhere. But um, OK, um, your Netflix show Midnight Mass, where you played yourself, an actual aged less vampire that lurks in the tombs and catacombs in Palestine has made quite the splash. The show seems to imply that either Jesus was a vampire, either bit by you, or might actually be you. Uh, well, what do you have to say about these allegations? 
Oh boy, this question drives me batty. For thousands of years, no one thought to ask me this. But now that I'm on Netflix, do you know how many times I've been asked this lately? One time, two times, three, ah, uh, ah, four times, five, six times, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Yes, many times, I, I understand it. That's got to be draining and a, quite the pain in the neck. I cannot break my NDA, but I can say this. Don't forget to welcome your listeners to join the Life After Secret community on Facebook. Give to the show's Patreon monthly and leave a nice one star, two star, three star, four star, five star. A five star review on iTunes. Thank you kindly for joining me on the show and opening up. You really made yourself very trans so vulnerable. <laughs> ha 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 ha. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Brady. <laughs> My pleasure. You're quite welcome. What did you say? Say again? I'm what? Oh, I said you're welcome. Quite welcome. Oh, uh, sounds like somebody's at the door. Angel, I gotta get going. Angel, what, what are you doing here? Now, back to the episode of The Life After. And we hope you have a wonderful Halloween. Fall Festival. Welcome back. As somebody who is a fundamentalist, I took it very literally, repressed myself for years. And when I started to deconstruct and running into people online um, that were talking about queer theology, it was kind of presented as something I should have noticed this whole time. I had like this, oh, you are fundamentalist. You just didn't understand. You're just taking things too literal. But then when I did look at it metaphorically or how it was being described, I was still left lacking. Um, and felt like I was being told that I should be seeing something that I wasn't. Can you kind of speak to that a little bit in what your experience and intention of that theology is? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I feel like there's a lot of queer theology out there that's just apologetics. And it's just make, it makes excuses for it apologizes for the church and the way that it it is and tries to spin it in another light so that it makes it more appealing to queer people. Um, but it is still the same oppressive structure. It, it, it still has the same problems across the board <laughs> um, that, that come with being a, an organization that has made war, uh, collapsed societies, has um, conquered and colonized uh, half the world. So I think with that, where queer theology as apologetics fails is in taking that same sort of like paternalistic attitude to towards like theology and making it feel making the people who are just starting to encounter it feel like they should have known this all along because like how how would you have known how would you have known when every single theological resource around you said otherwise and also said it was the truth so like for it like it almost to me it feels like victim blaming in a way that no theology should <laughs> um it gives queer people queer theology as apologetics gives queer people permission to stay in within the church which for people who want that that's great um for me there is a way to do theology queerly <laughs> um in a way that like just completely destroys the category of theology itself in theology you think about it as like the words we use to describe god okay well for queer people where do we encounter god and that is the question that i'm most interested in exploring with doing queer theology in the ways that i want to do it like not even how where do i as a theologian encounter god in a way that i can describe it and uh, make it relevant for queer people. When you said that you do theology queerly, it really clicked with me. The way that I do theology as a secular person queerly is to use science fiction because I feel that it's doing that thing, but isn't necessarily dependent or based on storytelling that's going to include that God 
character because I'm what I'm what I question now in our society and in our culture that is so marked by fundamentalism and a bad side of religion, but also misinformation and deconstruction and so many people leaving. I'm wondering if tomorrow's storytelling or theology is just not going to involve that basis at all. What, what are your thoughts on that? One of the things I love the most about science fiction is how with within science fiction tell, storytelling, like it is science fiction tells a story about the future of humanity through the advancement of technology and science. Right. So like within that, it's also telling a story about the human relationship to the divine, because I mean, I, I read a lot of novels and in almost every single novel, there is always some either rogue religious sect or some helpful religious sect or some really weird, wacky the religious sect um, that it's just like illustrating how, like, again, another possibility for what like the human relationships to the divine could look like. Um, through how it tells the story, science fiction uh, is exploring how culture and society is evolving and how it's changing. And with these changes, whether or not we need the divine to be decent to each other is a question that it explores how technology will change the human ability to be uh, in relationship with with itself is something that science fiction explores in a way that theology uh religion the bible just like or i'll say i'll say in a way that Christianity done by fundamentalists and I mean, in a way that Christianity done by Christians does not. <laughs> We're, and like, I say this as someone who is still like active in, in a church reluctantly. So, but still active. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of looking to the past to inform how we will relate to each other in the future uh, within Christianity. Within science fiction, it's a lot of looking to the future and thinking about the future to inform, to identify what we need to change to better relate to ourselves now. How has your definition of the divine changed or how has it evolved over time? Oh, it's so big. <laughs> It's the definition has just gotten so big um, to the point where I can't really define it. I feel like I know it when it's there, uh, but to say that I have any sort of beat on it is to then limit its scope so much that it becomes ineffective. <laughs> um, I wonder with deconstruction being a huge part of where a lot of us are coming from and, and a lot of us are coming from an understanding trauma and are literally triggered at times by religious talk or just like even, I mean, you can't center a community on theology based around Jesus without the Bible, right? Like, like right. so there's certain, certain things that are going to be a stumbling block if I can use that word, uh, that are going to be a stumbling block if, if the goal is to have inclusiv inclusivity and intersectionality. But the actual storytelling technique in some of the characters used itself becomes a stumbling block. I'm wondering if kind of the next generation of that, though, might include how to tell those things, but in a way that's more approachable to everyone's experience, human to human language, instead of being centered on a character that's a, a rightfully so a turnoff by their, their, their experiences. I'm wondering what science fiction can do with that and step in or how to marry that, et cetera. Um, what do you think? What do you think the future will look like? I think more and more that the Bible will become just another collection of stories. I think people yeah. will be okay with that because there are so many examples of human relationship in 
like science fiction and in just these other methods and modes of storytelling that allow for that sort of like bigness to really come through wow for for something as triggering as theology can be there needs to be another way for people to be able to enter into it because like yo <laughs> christianity has never been all that there was <laughs> Yeah, right. right, right. <laughs> when you say there needs to be another way to it, can we describe that it? I, I yeah. think what you said definitely the how do we know ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. I think like that, mm-hmm. like reflection, um, not a we need to fit into these boxes, but you objectively look at your own box. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, uh, now I know who I am, right? Um, or the other thing is is how to treat others around you. That's a big one. Um, what other things is is really at the heart and what's really super necessary from religion or theology that we we can extract from it? I think to be able to say, oh well, I don't know who I am. I would like to explore and have that be okay. Like that time of of searching. Exploration, adventure, and treating your own person, yourself, as a great adventure to be embarked upon. So a thing that we we can't miss out on is having space held for us to grow, to to really thrive Mm -hmm. uniquely. The thing happens when we leave fundamentally, we don't know that much about ourselves. My friend Jamie, she mentioned, I didn't even know what her favorite color was. And there's like little practical things that I've had to do, like set a playlist of like just this weird hodgepodge of songs that I really like, that when I'm having a little bit of a disassociated moment where I like, oh my God, what am I doing? Who am I? How am I not this person that I used to be? Whatever. I could go back to and be like, no, this is who I am. And I really like this song, damn it. Um, and it, it represents me. That sort of thing is really important. I've been trying to use the word weology, the story Ooh. of us. And, and if that's the focus, I would rather that be what we start with and not the Theo part, personally, just as a secular humanist. Like, if it's not something that I can pull off the shelf and say, like, how, and, say, and, and, like, and, and it's obvious where I fit, like chances are that's not my entry point. Mm. So what, like, so then the question for me becomes like, what is my entry point? That entry point time and time again has been science fiction where there is adequate queer representation. Like I, I read, uh, like I read a lot. Right. So like in almost every story I have read in almost every book that I have read, and this is harsh, this is probably also due to my own biases and my own like, particularities around what kind of books I read. There are always queer main characters. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Main characters who are experimenting with gender in some way, characters Mm -hmm. where there is some sort of sexual fluidity and there is like gender fluidity. Something that has become so normalized in science fiction where I look at that and I'm like, oh, oh, there I am. It's a representation that transcends storytelling that tries to tell us what to believe faith is a command right uh, believe this no we don't have to believe this. the belief was already there because we experienced it all you had to do is show us our experience and we're like all right i believe i'm on board i'm with this you know ellen ripley was frowns breaking at her time you oh know? yeah yeah she was <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, and Star Trek was not allowed to really have that much queer representation until recently because of uh, the producing and blah, 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 blah. But it just got queer as fuck lately. And I mm-hmm. love that because that meta narrative, too, says something about the culture, the meta narrative of science fiction looking ahead and then saying, why aren't we accepting these people? Oh, because of this weird ass story from the, no, okay, okay, okay. No, no, no. In this story, we're cool with this and then able to reframe it. Um, that meta narrative of, of us looking ahead, creating progress instead of us looking behind to see what we need to be conserving that is the way of the future, and that can also ripple down into our own lives. Of we don't need to keep reinforcing who we used to be and fighting to keep certain beliefs alive. Let's learn to evolve where we are into who we are. Exactly, and it's a question of who 
who do I want to be? Who do I want to be? Like, who, how do I want to show up? Who do I want to, who am I showing up for? Like all of these questions, I feel like are questions that science fiction plays with in ways that Christianity just doesn't. (laughs) Speak to me on your, what drew you to science fiction? What attracted you to it? How, what, what is your, what is your, um, your story and your background with that? Science fiction really became a part of my life. Uh, because I needed to be able to imagine that other ways were possible and other ways of, th- ways of being, ways of living were possible. Like where I was at the time in my hometown, I felt like, like this can't possibly be it. So what else is there? And science fiction just kind of challenged the, the, the limits of my own understanding to uh, really make me see like what could be out there, what else could be out there. Um, Not just in terms of like where I am fixed in like my like geographical location where I was in California, where I was like on planet earth, but like, yeah, on planet earth in space in time, like, like what is it about this moment that uh, makes me who I am? I think the Matrix was really the thing that like opened me up. That to, makes like, so much sense. <laughs> to, like some of these big questions, you know, like the idea that the world could just be a simulation. The world as we know it is a simulation and there's actually something really deep going on behind it. That just got me thinking, I'm like, yo, what? How have I been programmed? (laughs) In what ways have I been programmed to think the ways I do, to desire the things that I desire, to like want what I what it is I want from life? Like, and is there a way to deprogram myself from it? Because do I want this because I've been told that I should want it, or because I actually want it? Mm. It's a huge question to sit with for an eighth grader, but um, like <laughs> that's the fun part about religion is getting to be so young when we start having existential crises. You know, uh, who gets to say they had that experience at such a young age? <laughs> I appreciate the way that you use stories to reflect. I think that was a huge and very important part in my upbringing with fundamentalism. We're won over by stories. We're not won over by information or facts or charts. It's when we hear a story that's what in our brain, what we've been adapted and evolved to do. When we take that deep breath and we go through our deconstructions and we have a different relationship with storytelling. We could do exactly what you're saying of looking at it as a way to look into the future and to have hope. It's a different type of hope, not one that's based on some supernatural whatever coming in at the last second, but one about my stuff is Star Trek, right? It's about Mm -hmm. a lot of diverse communities and people from all over the galaxy, working together um, for problem solving and find a solution to overtake corruption, etc. Fucking science fiction does that. Tell me exactly. more about exactly. how science fiction has helped shape the, your ethics or kind of your your self reflection. Science fiction has just always been about like what where we're going has just always been about where we're going and for me it incites the question of how do how do we get there so like yeah being a kid watching star trek and seeing like these different ways that people like came together to like problem solve and like people across uh different races different planets working together my question was always was never really how is that possible so much as it was well, how do we do that? How, how, how do I, how do we do that? Um, and I think that's, that's the most compelling thing for me about science fiction is it's, a, it, it, it's, it, it's always, there's always a piece of it that's grounded in the world that we live in now. Uh, there's always a little, a little, a little taste of it. And the creators ask a what if question and then project that what if question into a future event, into a future, like a story about the future follows it to a logical conclusion. Um, 
like for Star Trek, like Gene Roddenberry saying, well, what would a world look like that didn't have any sort of prejudice or uh, hatred of long, like racial socioeconomic status? What would that look like? From there, he said, well, there would there would probably not be any money because money is a great divider. Um, there would probably like, well, the, there would be people working together. There, there would be a boom in scientific advances. So like we'd be space travel would be possible. Uh, and the crew would be like eth- multi-ethnic. The crew would be from all different parts of the world. Yeah, that makes sense. And then he made a show. That's just all about the adventures of this crew with that world built up around it as it already is. Because like in his mind, like that's the direction that it would automatically go. It's like, oh, of course. The the science fiction, it creates the hope in an example because we could see the attributes in those characters that we like and then want to do that in a way that, you know, in in the Bible, I've the kind of, always have to compare this to fundamentalism of what I grew up with and that form of storytelling. I remember even growing up and being a little frustrated and intimidated by Star Trek, especially when I got older into my really literal, like Calvinist time. Oh, it's horrible. But I was like, I was like, I, I had enough understanding of, of things in Hollywood and, and like just progressiveness and, especially Star Trek. And I was like, they were ahead on like women representation. They had like Voyager. They were like ahead on like people of color themes that like we now in our society try to act like we try to retcon ourselves and be like, Oh no, we were all on board with this from the beginning. You know, we were all cool. I could see that other themes were doing that better. And I was like, why is it that the people who have the Holy spirit are the last to do shit? Why are we the last to realize that slavery is wrong? Like, what the fuck? And I would see these things to compare it to. And one of them was like fucking Star Trek, where they're all being represented a different way. And then I started to realize that even at a young age, started to like not like TV shows if there were just too many white people in them. And it was just like those small little things that then when community came along, and I'm like, oh my God, there's more than one person of color in the main cast. Is that allowed? And I was able to like see more of humanity reflected. Science fiction allowed us to do that in a way that when we were fundamentalists, we just had a bunch of misogynistic men who look alike probably. And they don't look like me, despite what the pictures may tell you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, fundamentalism does a great job of, of sequestering its people into believing this one narrative and this one result is the most important thing the one result the jesus is returning the establishment of the kingdom right like like that's the whole the whole of it uh unless you're a rapture uh, a rapture christian then like the rapture <laughs> but uh that aside science fit like where christianity asks how do we live according to this way outlined in this book that was written a millennia ago? (laughs) Um, These stories that were written over, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, but hundreds of years before now, where science fiction looks at where we are now and says, where are we going? Mm. Is that where you want to (laughs) go? It asks the question instead of making a declarative you know statement your approach to spirituality is we're all people with beliefs fundamentalism or beliefs that are just happen to be attached to people so Mm -hmm. if you had to give some advice to somebody like me who prayed to god and didn't hear anything back around my queerness and so my queerness is represented outside of god narrative now what would you say, what advice would you give to me um, as a theologian? I'm not sure I would give advice. Wait, no? Here's what I would say. I'd say, I'd ask, can you be okay with the question? Like, can you be okay with the questions? You need space to grow. You need space to, to know where to go, et cetera. Um, are you going to be willing to step through those doors? Right, right. I feel like so much of fundamentalism is about having answers um, and about 
yeah, it's about having an- answers and everything being definitive and being defined by this one narrative, right? Like if you have a question about it, well, you just have to go to the book. You have to pray harder. You have to do uh, uh, X, Y, and Z. There's a prescription for whatever ails you. And coming out of that, I think one of the biggest the biggest questions, or one of the biggest tasks for people who are just starting on this journey is just to, is learning to, to accept that there, there are questions and that you're not going to have answers to and that that's okay. And part of the human experience, one of the great joys for me, at least the human experience is searching, is searching for those answers um, or uh searching for answers and then uh learning to ask the question in a different way so that the answer you get today will be different than the answer you got yesterday (laughs) that's brilliant because it shows progression it shows change and growth that's what we should be doing not just trying to keep the old ways going uh our world is changing and not only is it changing but the way our our understanding of what's already been going on forever is changing Mm -hmm. and we need to catch up to that before we continue to try to replicate the same past over and over and over we want to learn from the future by looking to the past i love that built into science fiction are those lessons not necessarily in religion in some ways they are but in some ways they're 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 not there's not a way to kind of like course correct but Science fiction kind of gives us an opportunity to, to do that now. Um, the Bible, for instance, it stopped, it ended, it's over, but now our needs are different. Mm-hmm. I asked you if you would be willing to watch an episode of Next uh, Star Trek Next Generation and talk about it. <laughs> do you mind giving a, a short description of this episode and kind of like what it is and uh, how it ties into our conversation and you and your work? Yeah, so uh, in this episode, it's it's called Darmok, and the uh, the Enterprise encounters uh, a race of people, the Tamarians, who uh, speak in metaphor. And Picard uh, finds himself on uh, a planet, on the, the the surface of this planet, with. Uh, with 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 a Tamarian and they're trying to communicate and they can't because the uh, first the Enterprise internal translator couldn't translate their language so they couldn't really uh, understand each other there. It was translated, but they would get like the words of the metaphor, but it didn't mean anything to them because they didn't have the reference points of the people or things that were being mentioned. Right, right, right. <laughs> so they're on the surface of this planet and Picard and, and Dathon, that's his name, right? Dathon? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they're on this planet and they're trying to communicate and they're just getting so frustrated and they have to learn how to work together and how to communicate uh, across all of their differences um, so that they can survive. <laughs> Um, I love this episode, especially, I mean, I love this episode in general, but for like this conversation, it's it's, like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> but for like, for this conversation and talking ab- across divides and talking across, like being able to communicate with people who don't necessarily understand you being patient enough to try being yes. patient enough to, uh, to uh make the effort to really put in the work and to do it and to also like know that uh there are things that are just not going to be cultural reference points and you can ask questions and asking questions is actually okay (laughs) Um, he didn't know how to communicate so he just kept on repeating um the one phrase of these metaphors but you don't know the reference point of is this a violence or is this friends because right. a part of their showing friendship involves knives what killed me about it is it reminded me so much of meme culture mm-hmm. and the part in it where all of the executive officers are sitting there listening to and basically discussing meme culture uh they just sounded like boomers in a funny way like sorry boomers they were listening no disrespect but it was like they were just in these very like matter of fact like caring ways they're like 
So these people talk with metaphors. How can we? And it just sounded like older people trying to understand millennials and Gen Zs, like <laughs> new culture, you know. <laughs> So the picture doesn't actually represent the words. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but, because this, this, this episode actually became a meme template thing where people would take it and then they would type out or describe a meme, right? So mm-hmm. they would be like, you know, Pikachu with puzzled face. Or, um, you know, what what would be another one? Uh, Oh, Felicia as she leaves, you know, by Felicia. Felicia. (laughs) And so when they were, when he was repeating these sort of like really shorthand metaphors that represented an entire story, Picard had to figure out what that meant. And they had to find a common language together and so when they were telling, trying to, you know, share stories together, uh, it involved like figures or trying to gesture, et cetera, until they realized, no, this is a story of two cultures who don't understand each other having to fight together. Yes. As yes. One. Yes. And we found that out whenever a monster came at them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, then, then Picard took the knife. <laughs> yeah, but like the ways in which, and I, I love this too, because I think it's Worf who, like Worf the Klingon, who uh, initially suggests that like, oh, perhaps he wants you to engage in ritual combat. <laughs> mm-hmm. so that's what his culture would do, trying to right. apply his background to that. Right, right. And so the ways that our own cultural understandings can completely miss um, Mm. what's happening for another person and how like these items, how like specific items or like uh, uh, stories show up in other cultures, like the way they they can just completely miss that. I I love how Star Trek just kind of illustrates that, you know, and so succinctly. (laughs) There's an emotional moment towards the end where they battle this monster and Dathan's going, it, it's clear he's going to die. And he kind of tries to gesture that he wants to hear Picard tell a story. Mm-hmm. And what you're talking about is when the story misses the point. But in this one, he still wanted to hear a story from, he wanted to hear a story while he was dying And even though he didn't understand it, just being told a story by another human to know that they're not alone in their last moments. And the gift that Picard gave of himself a story, just that was beautiful too. Touched me about just the humanity in storytelling and the importance. It's our superpower. Nobody else Mm -hmm. has it. It's what is unique about our species um, and to see that it has healing powers even when it's not being understood because it creates comfort and knowing that we're not yes. alone. Yes. Isn't that just what it is? That's what the, that what we want as humans just to know that we're not alone. It's the first step of normalizing our situations and when we are feeling like we're not always on that survival mode or having to defend just being alive. Mm-hmm. And that's when we really can reflect and find out who we are. Exactly. Not having to, uh, not as we're not being reduced to just like our basic, like needs for survival. It's just, we're actually able to revel in the, the wonder and the marvelousness of another being there in front of us. Be able to say like, Oh, Oh, you're full of stories too. Tell me one. This is the best response. You're full of stories. Coming toward the end of the interview, probably to let people like go off and like, I don't know, cook or something. Can you tell me of one more that has been 
integral, something you're watching now, something that you really appreciated. Um, can you just geek out about it for a few minutes? And um, Oh, uh, so I wrote my master's thesis on this book, actually. Actually, no, I'm going to talk about something different because Ooh, okay. I, I love Left Hand of Darkness as much as I love Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin. My, probably my favorite living writer right now is N.K. Jemisin. Okay. And I've got uh, <laughs> one of her books um, on my shelf. I've got the fifth, the fifth season. The fifth season. Yeah. And the Broken I, Earth trilogy. And I understand there's a more queer book uh, that she wrote. So I downloaded that for my Kindle. Tell me more. Yes. Um, she has a, a, a collection of short stories that came out, I think, in 2019 called How Long Till Black Future Month. And those short stories just. They, I, as I read them, they read me <laughs> um, in like the best way possible uh, and like really forced me to, uh, to ask like some deeper, deeper questions of myself. Um, she has one story um, that it's the first story in this collection. It's called The Ones Who Stay and Fight. And it is a direct response to a short story that Ursula Le Guin wrote in the 60s called The Ones Who Walk Away from Homeless. Mm. And these two stories in conversation, is just they just show the uh, evolution of social change movements and the ways, uh, like our own even conception of them and how in these like past... Uh, 40 to 60 years like people have gone from like oh well i have gone from seeing conditions that they can't tolerate and walking away from them and like not being able to and saying like i can't live with this so i'm gonna go find something better or create something better to be able to say like no how how do we fight this together i think for me that has been just such a remarkable exercise to engage in as a, a science fiction lover, as a theologian, as uh, someone who just appreciates movements <laughs> in general to be able to see like, okay, just in these past, these past few decades, this is how it's gone. This is how people have, have started to like, this is how the conversation has changed on a more social level. It's not about like ignoring or, or walking away from it. It's not about, it's not uh, about leaving so much as it is about sticking it through and bringing, sticking it through, improving it and making, bringing everybody along with you. That's really ridiculous. The parallel, as you're describing, I'm hearing Picard and Daphne that they get stuck at the planet. They're, you know, the whole enterprise is trying, how do we get Picard out of there? How do we get him out of there? But the, the real thing was, no, you were both here together. We're going to fight this shit together. Mm -hmm. um, and that unification, that's what kind of solidifies a better future and real, prog real progress, not one that's just trying to retcon some fucked up text or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just like, oh no, we were we've been here all along. Surprise! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell me the name of that and where uh, and how the listeners can find. Uh, so uh, the the story itself is called "The Ones Who Stay and Fight" okay. uh, by N. K. Jemison, and it's in a collection called "How Long Till Black Future Month." Beautiful, Black Futurism. I saw that was a part of uh, your thing. I, I've. I saw a documentary and it was so flippant intriguing, especially the stuff that was kind of written during the black exploitation film times as well, because it had concepts and the design was so beautiful, but mm -hmm. it came from a time of saying, no, you're going to keep on trying to imagine a future without us. We'll make our own and it's going to be pretty damn awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, uh, Afrofuturism is like, it's from a literary standpoint, it's, it's just, it explores all of these questions around like um, 
that science fiction explorers, but also like from very much from a, a black perspective, mm. um, and uh, like what the future looks like for black people, um, given the conditions that we're living in now. That old story, Whoopi Goldberg, she was a little girl. She was watching Star Trek. She saw Lahora and she said, Mom, there's somebody who looks like us on television and she's not anybody's maid or help. Mm -hmm. And that's why she became an actress. She That representation had real life effect. We would not have Whoopi Goldberg. If, not only that, but just like so much like fucking like important representation of people of color, interracial relationships that like when we fu- imagine that future, we put it onto our media, then our re- our culture reflects it in a way that is healthy <laughs> and um, actually does the progression that it should be doing, you know? Yo, Star Trek had the first interracial kiss on television. <laughs> um, That's slightly debated, and it was still kind of problematic, but, you know, yes, it did break some barriers. There. Yeah, it, 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 it broke some barriers. Uh, and I know, like, that story, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. meeting Nichelle Nichols, mm-hmm. <laughs> saying, like, he watches he watched the show with his daughters, and he was a huge Star Trek fan because it gave him hope. She was going to leave the show to do movies and uh, he convinced her to stay. Well, I think this is about time. Um, thank you so much, Taj, for giving me so much of your time today and allowing us to have these conversations. I appreciate the hell out of you. Um, can you remind us where we can find your uh, social media? Absolutely. It's uh, at Taj.speaking uh, on Instagram. And uh, on my website, uh, TajMSmith.com. Well, I have a little saying that I end the episodes with, and that is, um, if you don't go to church, Sunday is just the second Saturday. I'll see you next time. This has been an episode of the Life After Podcast. Find us on Facebook for our secret online community. Find our merch on TeePublic, monthly contributions on Patreon, and don't forget to rate and review the show on iTunes. Used to hate myself, congratulations, you played yourself Out of mental health and living itself Speak for yourself, your marriage not a testimony Don't believe the church is a bribe, but she owe me alimony I'm a pony up and stick a feather in your ceremony Wearing weddings out, I call it Yankee Doodle Matrimony And I'm only getting started, my tongue is fire Fighting gaslighting leaders like your ways are not higher I don't need a choir to bring down the entire empire You threw the gasoline I'm just spitting matches through the wire I'm just trying to break them free Make them see the refrains and mental chains of slavery I disagree with any preacher, teacher, not on defeat I repeat, I don't need a church to walk in victory I'm complete And everybody say, and everybody say Please, pull some strings for me Go, 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 go.